Um, so, you know, in the early 1990s, uh, when people first learned about the internet, um, the technology came with a very seductive promise, right? It, uh, it promised to basically solve all of our problems. Um, it, um, it was supposed to create a more egalitarian, more democratic world. It was supposed to be a ma this kind of magical thing that was going to make the world, much, the world better. And I remember th um, this, this pretty well because th at the height of this, at the, height of, at the beginning of the dot-com boom is when I, when I came to America with my family. Uh, we, um, we left uh, so the Soviet Union in 19 1989 and we settled in, in San Francisco. Um, and it was interesting because we had left uh, the Soviet Union, which was a, a, a utopia that had failed, right? Um, yet we came to this new country, to this new land that we didn't really understand yet. And suddenly all around us, there was a new utopia that was at hand. It was, it, again, the Internet uh, promised to do all these things that, in a way, communism couldn't do. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, you know, if you opened up Wired magazine, you know, you'd, you'd, there'd be people talking about how, because of network, network, networks and computer technology, you know, the stock market will never crash again. It'll only keep going up. You know, they talked about how, you know, things are going to be completely free because, look, on the Internet you get things for free. That means it's going gonna, it's gonna, uh, to roll out. It's going to infect everything in the economy. So, I mean, it's going to be just this sort of bountiful, plentiful uh, society uh, driven by technology. You know, you wouldn't even have, need to have governments anymore because you'd have direct democracy uh, mediated by a, a, a network, a global network. So there would be no, there'd be like one global society where everybody was fed, there was no poverty, there was no uh, really inequality because computer technology would be able to um, balance power between the, even the, the, the most powerful corporation and sort of the, the lowliest individual. And, and that was in the 90s. And I, and I was infected by this and a lot of people that I knew uh, in the immigrant community in, in San Francisco, I mean, everyone went to computers. You know, first of all, that's where the money was. And uh, second of all, it was, it was an exciting place to be, and, ex and it was an exciting vision. Now, of course, 30 years on, um, well, you know, things turned out a little different, right? Um, the Internet, um, well, you know, the Internet isn't, we don't live in a utopia, let's put it this way. <laughs> and um, the Internet really hasn't changed politics fundamentally or changed society on a kind of fundamental, uh, on a fundamental level, right? It's, of course, we have a lot of new technology and a lot of ways of communicating, a lot of new ways of uh, consuming information and watching uh, movies and um, entertaining ourselves. Uh, but it hasn't really changed the fundamental power structures of, of global society, right? Um, and at its core, the Internet itself and the companies that control it, you know, have kind of become more and more uh, almost like a, a kind of a giant surveillance machine. Like, it's a place where we, you know, we use these things, we, we you know, uh, sometimes very, are very excited by them, but we don't really have any power. And yet, th in the system, everything that we do is tracked, it's monitored, it's analyzed in some way, we don't, and we don't really know what's actually happening behind the scenes, right? Um, and so, so the question that I wanted to answer in this book um, was what happened? So where did the, the utopian promise go astray? Uh, why didn't it turn out the way it was supposed to? Right? Why was this another failed, why is this another failed utopia? Um, and you know, the thesis of my book is uh, pretty simple, you know, it's, it's that the internet was never some kind of magical democracy machine. Um, it was um, quite simply a surveillance tool built by the Pentagon in the 1960s um, during the Vietnam War by ARPA, which is now known as DARPA. Um, and in the book, I tell a story that spans half a century. Even I even go back to the 19th century to look at the earliest computers, and um, that became IBM, the punch card tabulators. You know, I mean, there's one thing that I think shows um, um, our kind of naive understanding of the internet uh, today very well. And um, 
like for instance, I, I know that ev everyone is freaked out about Russia and freaked out about how Russia had somehow weaponized the internet and used it uh, to subvert American democracy. And uh, you know, I talked to a lot of people about this and people really believe that Russia had done something unprecedented, right? That no one had done what Russia had done. It had taken um, what was normally a, a, a platform for democracy uh, and had corrupted it into a weapon of influence and then used that, that weapon to help elect the president, right? Um, but as I talk to people, about this, I, I keep going back to the history of the internet and I keep thinking how this idea is based on a very false pr premise that there was ever a moment in the internet's history when it was, when it was pure and untainted. Uh, the fact of the matter is that internet was um, designed to be a weapon of influence um, going back to the 1960s. Um, and that's what it was designed to be from the very beginning. And it continues to be a weapon of influence today, as we, as we can all see and as, as we can all uh, understand very well. So, but now it's just a much more powerful weapon of influence, much more powerful than anyone in the, in the 1960s or 1970s when the ARPANET was created could, could have foreseen.